Thessalonians chapter 3. Starting in verse 6, let's read a few verses to get back into this. Verse 6 says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, and not according to the tradition which you received from us. Uh, the word quickly from last week, because it's, it's a very strong command here, uh, not that it's a command can be any stronger. What I mean by that is what a thing to ask a Christian to stay away and avoid another Christian. And that's exactly what he just did. By, in the name, in, by everything that Jesus Christ is, we command you to follow this command. Steer clear of. The word stello in the Greek, keep away from. Steer clear from. Or to place oneself away from. It also means to purposely avoid association with someone. Paul is telling them, there are people in your midst living this way. They're a bad influence for you. I've already warned them, as we saw last time. In 1 Thessalonians, he warns these people. By 2 Thessalonians, a few months later, nothing has changed. Separate from them. There are some Christians in the church that we're supposed to separate from. Keep away from every brother, not, not person, but brother, fellow Christian, who leads an unruly life, not according to the tradition which you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. Because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you. So Paul is saying, when we were there, we chose to live life in a certain way to be role models for you. He says, you know how, we, how you ought to follow. We didn't act in an undisciplined manner among you. In verse 8, he says, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. We didn't receive anyone's prov provision as a gift. But with labor and hardship, we kept working. You see that theme of working, working, working. He says it four or five times in this five or six verses. We didn't eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship, we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. And you say, we well, look up here and say, well, Rick, why don't you have a job? Keep reading. I hope, I don't think any of you would, would say that. You understand the church. But in verse 9, he says, not because we don't have a right to this. So yes, by labor and hardship, we kept working day and night to not be a burden to you, but not because we don't have a right to be a burden to you. But there was a different reason we chose to live this way, it says, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. I would think that in the time that Paul was there, there was already a problem in the church. They leaned this way, it seems. Because as we'll read in just a minute, he says, I we, we had this discussion when I was there. Not in my first letter two months ago, but while I was there in person, we had this conversation. So obviously this non-working Thessalonian uh, group that was gathering as this young church had an issue here. And Paul and his team chose, instead of getting provision from the church to work for themselves, to pay for their own for their own food. So the problem in the church, again, is that some people weren't working and providing for themselves. They weren't eating their own food. And Paul says, I have a right. We have a right as ministers of the gospel, as messengers of the word of God, to be supported by the churches that are under our tutelage. But we have chosen to forego this right and to work a job instead to be a role model for you people who have this issue with not working. He had to be, or he did this to be an example of hard work to the Thessalonians, not to show that this is the way the ministers of the gospel should live their lives. you got to get a job, support yourself, and also do what you do for the church. That's not why he did this. 
Last time we went to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. If you weren't here, write that down. I mean, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 3 through 12. We saw Paul outline this in much greater detail. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 3 through 12. The fact that the pastor of the church has a right given by God to be supported by the church. Verse 10, we start new. It says, For even, even when we were with you, he's con concerning and continuing this same train of thought about not working in the church. We were a role model. You should be following our role model. But still there are people that are not doing it. Separate from them. Steer clear of them. I told you last time, it's just a, a, a truth of the world concerning influence that at any given time when you're around somebody, they're either influencing you or you are influencing them. That's the way humanity works. So if these people are going to influence you away from a life that pleases God, get away from them. Some people, you you got to cut the cord if they're simply unwilling to try to live a life that pleases God. You've got to cut the cord. And here's an example of that. We'll talk more about that as we go through this. For even when we were with you, face to face, for the two or three months that Paul was in Thessalonica before he had to be whisked off in the middle of the night because it got too dangerous, even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. So this, this it, it seems to be even bigger than, than 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, remember, they're getting this false teaching about the day of the Lord. We've gone through it over and over. And they're thinking, well, if we're in the tribulation, the Old Testament says that it only lasts a little while, a very short while, and then Jesus comes back to save the day on the white horse, etc. So we just won't work. And so there are a group of people that are taking the false teaching and going this route. But when you read verse 10, it, seems, it, it takes you back to the days when Paul was with them before the false teachers came in. Remember, there was no church before Paul got there. Paul is organizing this church. There was no Thessalonian church. Paul started that when he got there. But even when he was there for only two or three months, he had to give them this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. So it was already an issue made even worse by the false teachers who made them believe Jesus is coming back any second. At his second coming, Jesus is coming back any second. So it made the problem that they already had even worse. It says, if anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat. Now you know about if clauses. Four types of if clauses. A first class clause, if, and for the sake of argument, let's say that it's true. A second class if clause, if, for the sake of argument, let's say that it's not true. A third class clause, if, and maybe it's true and maybe it's not. It's a subjunctive clause. It's your choice. Maybe you'll do it. Maybe you won't. And the fourth class, fourth, fourth, boy, tongue got fat. What's in this water, Amy? It's happening. The fourth class if clause is an optative clause. And we know from the last few verses, the optative is a, is a, is a wish mood. I wish it was true. The fourth class clause is an optative. It's not true, but I wish it were true. So this is a first class if clause. Uh, the Greek, for those of you who want it, it's A plus an indicative mood verb. A is E-I. E-I, that's the word if. In the Greek, the word if is A. It's E-I. That's the whole word. And when you attach that to an indicative mood verb, you make a first class condition. Uh, I want to say this about this first class condition. It's not this. Listen to what I'm about to say. This is not what a first class if clause is. We're going to talk about this for three minutes because I've heard it and it's just not accurate in the Greek. 
if and it's true. The way that you interpret a first class if clause, this is the wrong thing, if and it's true. That's not, that's not proper Greek. A first class if clause says if and let's consider that it's true for the sake of the argument that we're making, okay? You see the difference? If and let's consider this to be a true statement so that I can tell you what the conclusion will be. If this is true, and let's assume that it is for the sake of argument, then this will occur, the second half, the, the protasis of this condition. If, and let's assume that it's true, is the proper Greek way to see, to look at, to interpret a first class if clause. So here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, if anyone is not willing to work, and let's consider for the sake of argument that that's true, that there are some among you that are not willing to work. Then the conclusion to that is, then he is not to eat either. If there are people, that's the proper Greek way to look at this. If there are people among you that are not willing to work, and let's consider that it's true, then that person is not to eat. It's for sake of the argument. Uh, I want to show you this because I use this word argument a lot, but I use it from a legal standpoint. I'm ta not talking about a fight between uh, two people arguing over something. I'm using it in this way. When you hear me say argument, this is what I'm talking about. In the legal sense, it's a reason or a set of reasons given with the aim of persuading others. It's a reasoning, it's a logical a progression of thought. That's what I mean by argument. So for the sake of argument, for the sake of Paul trying to say, if this is true, then this. Uh, that's, why, that's how I use this word argument. I just wanted to give you an example or, or a definition because I use that word a lot, but not in the fight sense. In the sense of making a legal, justified, logical reasoned through a persuasive argument. That's what I'm talking about. So if anyone is not willing to work, and let's consider for the sake of argument that that's a true statement, then starve that man out. That's what he says. I'm going to give you an example, and I don't really have time, but I'm going to give it to you. You can't, you can't say about an if clause, if and it's true. Because it's not always true. Look at this verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 13 and 14 has two first class if clauses in it. And if you say that the first class if clause should be translated if and it's true, then you got a big problem in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, and it's true. You see the problem? Big problem. But it is in Greek structure a first class if clause. So this is how it reads. If there is no... He's making an argument, a reasoned... Uh, he's, he's building the case that resurrection does is a reality. But he says this, If there is no resurrection of the dead, and let's assume for the sake of argument, that that's a true statement. There is no resurrection. Then not even Christ has been raised. That's a true statement. For the sake of argument, Paul says, let's consider for a moment that there is no resurrection. If that's true, then Jesus Christ isn't even resurrected. And you say, yeah, good point. He continues with another first class if clause. You can't define an if clause as if and it's true. It's not, it's not proper Greek. If Christ has not been raised, and let's assume for the sake of argument, for the sake of this dialogue, that Jesus Christ truly has not been raised, then everything that we're preaching, Paul says, is in vain. It's of, of no value, and your faith is also in vain because you will, you will die, someone who believes in Jesus Christ, and your body will rot in a tomb, and that will be the end of it. If there is a, no resurrection from the dead, there's no value in belief in Jesus Christ is what he's saying. First class if clauses 
in the negative. They're first class clauses. I just showed you that, uh, a little rabbit trail. So just for accuracy, a first class if clause is not to be translated if and it's true. And you should get that from 1 Corinthians 15. It's not always true. It's an argument tool, This the first class if clause. So what is he saying? If anyone is not willing to work, and let's consider for the sake of argument that this is true, then he's not to eat either. So Paul is teaching here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 that the loving thing to do Get a hold of that. The loving thing to do for the people in your congregation who are able to work but unwilling to work is to starve them out. We've probably all said at some time or another, when he's hungry enough, he'll eat. Probably about a pet or something. Oh, he doesn't like the new pet food. It's too cheap. We need to buy him something uh, more expensive. No, when he gets hungry, he'll eat. Same is true for these people in Thessalonica. Paul says, stop feeding them. Stop feeding them. When they get hungry, they'll go get a job and they'll buy their own food. Uh, so Paul is telling them to quit offering them the free meals. You people are enabling them to live this lifestyle because when they show up at your table, you feed them. If you stopped feeding them, if you showed a little tough love... Yes, love, but tough. If you quit feeding them, you would force them to get a job and buy their own food because they will get hungry. And when a man gets hungry enough, he will go get some food. So, in verse 11, oh, I'll make this statement. I wrote it down. I'm going to read it. It's, it is the loving thing to do because by getting a job and feeding themselves, they'll do several things. They'll stop living this out-of-order, unruly life. They'll also be imitating Paul, who showed them hard work as an example. And they'll also begin to please God with that portion of their lifestyle. When they come over for the free meal because they're unwilling to work and earn their own food, it's unpleasing to God. Do the loving thing cut them off, they will eventually go get their own job and find food, and that will be a more pleasing life before God that they're willing. So the question has to be asked, are you really doing the loving thing by enabling someone to live a life that's not pleasing to God? Paul's telling these people, I told you when I was there, if people are unwilling to work, then they should not eat. Stop Feeding them is the, is the logical uh, takeaway from that. Verse 11 says, For we hear that some among you, he says this again, he's already said it, he knows they're there. We hear among you, uh, this hear is in the present tense, we continuously and constantly and over and over are hearing that this is an ongoing problem in your church. Time to separate. Starve them out. For we hear over and over that some among you are leading, not, not all, but some, are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but instead acting like busybodies. We know what a busybody is. It's a, a good translation to the English. It's the word, uh, look, at that, look at that Greek word, periergotsomai. That's one of the big ones, periergotsomai. It means to be a busybody, but to put a, a finer point on it, it means to be intrusively busy, intruding in other people's lives. To intrusively, enthus in, uh, intrusively enthusiastic about offering help or advice. This isn't saying that a parent can't talk to a child or a friend can't talk to a friend. This is a category of busybody in Thessalonica. They're, instead of using their time productively and working, making a living for themselves, they've got all the time on the hands, they've got all the time in the world on their hands, and they're getting into other people's business instead of business of their own. So again, back up for a moment. Why were they doing this? This wasn't just a weakness. 
this busybody, non-working busybody lifestyle uh, interfering in other people's personal business lifestyle came about because of bad Bible teaching. It was biblical error. There were false teachers who had come along and had convinced some of this church that they were in the day of the Lord judgment. Look at it all in context. You're in the day of the Lord judgment period, a tribulation period. It's a very short period. And Jesus comes back at the end of that at the battle of Armageddon to save the day. So based on bad Bible teaching, they had quit their jobs and they're waiting for Jesus. Bad Bible teaching. That's why they were doing this. Yes, I think from verse 10, they had a, some had a propensity to this. They had a lazy streak in them. And now they had an excuse. Jesus is coming back. I'm, not, I'm really not going to go to work now. So they had a propensity to this even from the beginning. Some in their church. And then the fuel of the fire was the bad Bible teaching saying, He's coming back any minute now because we're in the tribulation. So they said, okay, great. No job for me. They were idle. They weren't working. They were leading disorderly, undisciplined lives. And Paul said, stop feeding them and separate from them. Because I've already talked about this. This is the third time. I said it when I was there, verse 10. I sent it in a letter in 1 Thessalonians. And now it hasn't stopped. Stop feeding them and separate from them as a church. Strong words. That's strong stuff. In verse 12, he says, Now such persons... Now he turns his attention to not the congregation at large, but he focuses on this group of idle busybodies, non-working busybodies, and he lays into them. Now such persons we command and exhort. Exhort. We're telling you again this exhort, uh, nutheteo, uh, to counsel somebody based on their lifestyle about the consequences of their actions. Tell them, guy, you're going down this road. You think this is a good road? This is disastrous. So he says, now to such persons, we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, everything that Jesus Christ is, was, and will always be. You do what we're about to say. Work in quiet fashion the command to the non-workers. Work in quiet fashion. Eat their own bread. You tell these people that we said, because whether they were in the church or not that day, who knows. But we all know who they are in Thessalonica. You tell them to get a job and to buy their own food. Some tough love. Boy, you read tough love in the Bible. It's not loving to enable somebody to live a life that doesn't please God. If someone's living a life that's pleasing God, you do everything you can to provide and help them, support them. If somebody's living a life that's not pleasing to God based on the Bible, tough love, man. Tough love is the only loving thing to do so that they will possibly turn and live a life that pleases God. You're not doing them a favor by enabling their ungodly, non-pleasing to God lifestyle. So such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus to work in quiet fashion to eat their own bread. Again, the command is only to the busybodies who weren't working, but instead were spending their, all, their, all their time looking into other people's lives in the church so eager to offer help and advice. I don't need it, uh, is, uh, is what Paul would have said. Don't need it, don't want it, not part of the Christian life. Get rid of all that. Why is Paul commanding them this? Because Paul has already cleared up the false teaching. 
I've cleared up the false teaching now. You should know that Jesus Christ is not going to return in a year and a half. He could return at any moment at the rapture, but we're not guaranteed that because you're in this day of the Lord tribulation period. Untrue. The false teachers lied to you, and Paul has already cleared that up. You're not in that period of history, so you don't know when Jesus is coming back. Get a job. Get a job. It says here, work in quiet fashion. It means to, to be in an untroubled state, free from disturbances. Work in an untroubled state, free from disturbances, especially free from noise and uproar. Live a quiet and peaceable life, it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1. That's what's, what's pleasing to God, that you lead a quiet and peaceable life. Live a life in an untroubled state, free from disturbances that are your own doing. Don't add to your own problems. Create self-induced misery. Get a job. Work in an untroubled state, free from disturbances. And also, with this job, provide for yourselves by your own food. What does it say here? And eat. In the Greek, it actually says, work in quiet fashion and eat. And that's all it says. It doesn't say their own bread. It just says eat. Esthio is the Greek word, E-S-T-H-I-O, and it means to take in food. The, kind of, the, the reference here obviously is to eat your own food. If you have a job and you eat, that means you're getting paid and you can provide for yourself. So you have to understand the context to be able to define what eat means. And obviously here it means eat your own bread, not other people's bread, like Paul did when he was there. Didn't accept other people's bread as a gift. He paid for it. Paid his own way. A slide and we're done. Four things here. Number one, all of us are to look out for those leading an undisciplined, disorderly, out-of-order kind of life and warn them, nutheteo, the word for exhort, warn them of the disastrous consequences of their actions and to keep away from them. Warn them and separate. This is the road that you're on. This is what God says through the Apostle Paul is the right way to be living. And when you're willing to do that, we can, uh, we can be in fellowship one with the other again. But until then, that one bad apple, son, you're going to ruin the whole church. Paul knew it, and he said, get them out. Separate from them. Number two, Paul's disciplined life was an example to be followed by the church. We see it two or three times in these five or six verses, do as we did, imitate us, mimeo, uh, this word for mimic. Number three, work for a living if you are able. Work for a living if you're able. And number four, stay out of other people's personal business. Again, this isn't, this, the, don't take that overboard uh, and, and say that a friend can't talk to a friend, uh, that's not what this is saying. It's in context to a certain group of people with a certain problem. So stay out of other people's business. And there is one more. I hope you're using the Bible properly as a measuring tool for your own life. This isn't just to look around at everybody. Oh, she's a busybody. He's a busybody. What about you? The Bible is between you and God. It's a very, very personal book. Uh, the Bible is called the canon of Scripture. The word canon is the Greek word kanon, K-A-N-O-N, and it means a measuring stick. It's the, it's the measuring stick that everything else is supposed to be measured by. That's what this Bible is. So I would say in closing, you're abusing the Bible if you think it's just a tool for measuring everybody else and all of their problems. Jesus, in Luke chapter 6, verse 41, why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye? Jesus. He doesn't say here, don't judge. He gives a proper way to do this. If you're going to evaluate somebody else, 
You better make sure you're clean first. Why do you look at the speck, this tiny little particle, uh, a woodworker? Jesus would understand getting specks in your eye. Why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log that's in your own eye? Your brother has a splinter in his eye he's having trouble with. And we're not talking about a physical splinter here. We're talking about a sin pattern. Why are you picking on your brother's sin patterns that's the equivalent of a little bitty speck in the eye, but your sin pattern in the same area is like a log sticking out of your face? It's so easy to look. We're all guilty of it. It's so easy to look outside yourself and see how Brother Russ is all messed up. It's just so easy, isn't it? And and we're looking through, the and and the world knows what we're doing. The world sees our hypocrisy. It's only us that, only ourselves are blind to this. Everybody else knows. Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take that speck out that's in your eye. I can help. I have the words of truth. Word of wisdom here and there. When you yourself do not see the log that's in your own eye. You hypocrite, Jesus says. First take the log out of your own eye and then go evaluate your brother. And then take the log, or or then you will see clearly to take the speck out that's in your brother's eye. Jesus doesn't say don't evaluate anyone. Live privately, the privacy of the priesthood. Live in your own little cocoon. That's not what he says at all. He just says use the Bible for what it's for. Find out what your problems are according to the Word of God. Don't overlook your sinful shortcomings like a hypocrite. Know who you are, take care of your own problem, and then engage your brother to help him. And then go engage your brother now that you can see clearly in a state of fellowship and to help him take the speck that in, that's uh, in his eye out. Please join us tonight at 6.30. We're not going to have a teaching session at all. We'll open in prayer. Bring a sack lunch if you hadn't eaten already. Um, We're just going to play games. We're going to do what John Adams said. He says it ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, guns, bells, bonfires, illuminations from one end of this continent to the other from this time forward forevermore. Happy 4th of July. Meet with us tonight if you can. Father, thank you for the time you've given us. Thank you most of all, Lord, for for the time that we remember Jesus the Christ, our Savior, the Lamb of God who satisfied you with His and through His sacrifice on the cross in our place. Thank you that we're eternally saved, that nothing, nothing could ever separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. We're yours eternally. We're in the palm of the hand of Jesus Christ, according to John chapter 10, verse 28 and your hand is covering His. We're doubly kept by the power of God. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this time. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.